Hey everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig coming at you for a, another episode of Ask the Bootmaker. Today we have Jim Brainerd here out of Colorado of JB Custom Leather. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining me. This is going to be so much fun and I am so honored to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's even better. <laughs> oh man. Uh, so I have a lot of questions, especially on one particular boot uh, that uh, is in the, I guess, the cover image of this interview. But I think I want to start things off with just your background and how you got into boot making, just so that we uh, set it up contextually for all the viewers right now. All right. Well, background is as a young kid and family and horse showing and rodeo, junior rodeo and stuff. Uh, I think as a the rodeo cowboy, you're always interested in leather stuff as a guy. I mean, a lot of us were. So, you know, I making hand tool belts and, and wallets and started doing shaps. And first, uh, we moved around a little bit from Colorado where I was born to Montana and Oklahoma and Oklahoma. Um, I always like to tell this story and I'm sorry, I got to do this, but it's uh one of the first experiences with boots period to me was my mom taking her boots to the repair shop down in uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. And we went in there and uh, picked up her boots. And it's a very stereo, what I call a stereotypical boot repair shop of, of the forties, fifties, sixties on um, very um, eclectic place. There's piles of leather, rubber, soles, heels, mess, glue. You don't know even what you're looking at. And I walked out of there with her and I said, I'll never work in a place like that. And this was 1973. By 1974, we moved back to Parker, Colorado. And I hit up in this Western store. Some some guy was talking, he goes, I need some cowboy polo shops. You know, he's asking the owner where he could get some. And I'm scared, little 14 year old. And I said, uh, I can make them for you. And the in the back of the shop happened to be another one of these uh, little boot repair shop guys he was subletting in the back and they noticed that from me and his wife said you know you ought to talk to him and, they, and he asked if I wanted to work there so a year later I was working in a place exactly like that and um, so it, it's always been kind of a funny thing to me in that but that that started the journey of of learning kind of the the basis of what footwear was how it was constructed by repairing it so from 1974 uh, on. I was in, in boot shoe repair, uh, saddle and tack repair, all the leather goods, and also doing the, the crafting of making things that I was doing. I'd learned the repair business from a third generation boot maker, Dave Hutchings, who we lovingly call Hutch. Uh, he is my mentor for the first five years as an a, a apprentice with him, but he didn't teach me boot making then. Um, it was familiar to the repair work. And for the next 27 whatever years I did boot and shoe repair build up a big business had you know retail footwear and all this stuff hadn't done any hadn't made any boots at this point um I got to the year 2000 and and uh kind of sold off part of my business to a partner I brought a partner in and I moved home I started working from home but it was like you know all I'm doing is repair and my wife said yeah you should call Hutch back up and and because he never taught you boot making so this was 13, 14 years ago, um, I did. I called him up and he did a typical two week course and I took his course and, and uh, learned the basics of boot making. Um, from there, so many new things opened up that I'd never explored before. And, and the most humbling experience of my life was boot making. It's, it's one of the most challenging. It's uh, very difficult. It's very uh, hair pulling as you can see. And um, you know, it's, <laughs> Experience that that goes on and won't it won't end for me at the end of my life because it's it there's too much to know and learn and and how to get there the process um, just as you think you you figured one thing out you haven't you know and the more I know the less I know it's just it's just bizarre as as far as how interesting intricate challenging difficult it can be and rewarding um, you know to take something that's flat piece of leather and turn it into this three-dimensional thing that you can wear and appreciate and feel good about and, and last a long, long time, you know, um, 
it, it's quite it's quite an interesting thing. So, uh, big part of all that that's kept me going though has been a couple of trade shows a year, and these trade shows: Wichita Falls, Texas, Sheridan, Wyoming, to get together with other boot makers to do seminars, to just sit down and talk with each other, to learn from from the the greats you know, and, and what they know who are all willing and able to give you so much and they help and, and to, to, to grow the craft, to try to keep it alive. Those are the things that really matter to me in this. It's, uh, you know, I want, a, I want a happy customer with a good pair of boots on their feet, but, and I want others to learn this craft and keep it going and, and to be part of that and see it happen. I love it. Short and- of the long story. Yeah, that's a great intro. I I think that's the perfect place to kick things off. And I, I'm super interested in the the competitions, like the ones at Wichita Falls that you mentioned. You recently won uh, a, a pair of boots that you that you made, uh, won it all, right? Uh, in 2020. Now that's the pair of boots that is in the cover image for this as the boot maker, and it's two pieces, right? You had one piece for the top and one piece for the foot when usually it's all four pieces. Can you tell me about that process and how it was so much different from other boots that uh, that we see every single day? I can, but I want to because then I also know I, I have peers listening to this. It didn't win at all, okay? It may, it, I did enter it in the class. It's called the master class. I'm not a master bootmaker and I don't pretend to be. Um, I don't know how you, uh, even the guys that are called masters, some of them are humble enough to say, I don't, you know, what classifies a master. And it, it, it takes, you know, whether I made 5,000 pairs of boots, if I have, you know, 200,000 hours of, of knowledge into it, that's, that's not the case. It just happened to be such a unique uh, different approach to a pair of boots. Um, it was very um, risky on my part to enter it there. Uh, there may not have been as many entries as there would be because of COVID and all that stuff, but it is something because this is what I, one of the things I love to do is to go outside the box and challenge it. Now, when you said it's two piece, it's a two piece boot. That's not a, that's not unheard of because a lot of times boot maker will make a one piece BAMP shaft down the front and one piece down the back. Okay, so it's truly a two piece, but it's a different two piece because the BAMP, the bottom is seamless, which means there's no side seams, there's no heel seam, it's all one piece. So that's the first part of it being two piece. The, The shaft is, or the top is a one piece, but it's seamed because the only way I can, uh, close it somewhere, I have to close it somewhere. So this is the one piece that you're talking about, the seam, but you're going to see right here on this vamp, you don't see any side seam because there isn't. Um, It's an alligator vamp and it's completely one piece. This, this is a process of stretching it over a last completely even, even over the cone and the top, the the pin post part of the, the last. And then once it's set and, and dried, then I can go in and cut it off around the top of the last to cut it free. So this kind of works backwards to the way typically we'll make boots. We'll, we'll make, uh, we'll cut out a vamp pattern. Um, most or many boot makers crimp that vamp to start to form the shape to it. Um, but it's just in the, in the uh, vamp, the four part, not the heel counter. Uh, the back part. So the crimp that and then go on, build all the rest of the stuff, do the artwork, the tops, get all that together. Then they get sewn together and then they get lasted at the end. All this, the, the boot is then put together and pulled over that last. So this one took a, a, a two turns at the last in order to make it. So the first one was to stretch that thing over the top. Why it was stretched, I went off to making the, uh, the top. And that's really a, was a process of I like this. No, I don't like that. I'll do this. No, I'll do that. And I mean, it just kept changing until I figured out what I wanted. And um, I love the colors. I'm a very um, natural, basic colors for myself. It's not that I made this boot for myself. I made it just to try to make it happen. So then um, 
the inside, the liner, we call it a drop in liner because it's another, it's a whole nother boot. Basically the liner of the, of the top and the liner of the vamp are all sewn together like I would normally a boot. And it, it actually has side seams in there on the inside. Um, can you hold it up to the camera so we can see the example? I don't know if I can. Uh, yeah. Okay. We can sort of see it pretty good. So there, yeah, there's no seam in there really is there well it is it's in it's an inside out seam okay it's hemmed and laid flat but when i'm saying it, it runs you know all the way down side seam so it's it's a front and a back and it's got a heel counter in there a hard heel counter just like i'd make any other boot um and it's attached to that drop in liner so then basically our drop in or i dropped over the the rest of it over the top of it and then lasted it so that then i could you know on to the insole and do the inseaming, sewing the welt on, and so we could put a sole on and all that. And after that, it, it was a matter to come back in. Well, all the all the hand lacing was done before I lasted it there, except all the way up to the top. I finished that after it came off. And then it's a- I think it was, it's such it a cool design. Well, I, I got this idea from, when I go to Sheridan show, leather crafters um they they run that show up there the world leather debut and all and i'd seen a one-piece shoe and it was done i i think a japanese artist had brought it and and it was a beautiful beautiful shoe and it was seamless one piece and i can see that it's i felt that might be it, there's nothing easy about it but i'm going to use the word easier to do because of how you can finish the, you know, the top or, or around a shoe, but then to add a boot top to it and finish it was just one more step that I thought, in my opinion, was a little more difficult. But trust me, it doesn't come, this boot still doesn't compare to that shoe. That shoe was just fantastic. It was all hand tooled in the sole and all that. And, you know, and tooling's nice in the sole, it's pretty, but if you're gonna wear it, then why do that? So, right. <laughs> That's yeah, that. if anybody wants to see how uh, Jim laid the alligator over top of the last for that one piece, uh, he has some great pictures on his Instagram, which is at JB Custom Leather. I highly recommend you go check it, check it out because he's documented the whole creation process. It's very interesting to look back at those now uh, when the boot is complete. How about that inlay? Does that tree mean anything to you? Um, why did you choose it? Well, I, again, like I say, I think I had some different ideas that I wanted. And I originally wanted to do this alligator as a tree. There's, it's not like tree of life. It's not, it just, it looked good I, in my mind. I'm going, I want that. But I had so very little of this alligator left in this same color. And it wasn't a color or a hide that I could go order and just to get some more. Um, and I thought I didn't have enough to do it, but I laid it out and worked out. You don't know that this tree has two or three pieces to it. Um, oh, wow. Where, I, where I've had to splice it in so I could have enough. And since there's two of them, you know, the left and right boot uh, had to do the same thing with both of them. But it just looked cool to me and in my mind's eye. And I was like, this would be really cool to bring this alligator up and, and run it right up in there. And then to kind of use the quills of the ostrich kind of look like parts of the tree of some, you know, or maybe even stars in the sky or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. It, it just became a thing in my mind that that's, what's fun about this kind of stuff. When you're, when you're working for a customer, you know, there's still a lot of that artwork goes on in your head when they're asking you to do some kind of inlay or overlay and, and where that may go and trying to get that conception for them to come to, to life. But when I do something like this for myself, I call it a concept boot or whatever. Um, you know, I can make it up as I go and change it as I go, whatever comes out. It's, uh, I almost tried something else and I thought, no, nope, this is what I want to do and it works. So I think it's a great great uh, practice example like that came out amazingly. I have a question about how you piece together um, the rest of the alligator through that inlay in a way that isn't noticeable when you're just looking at it. How, how did you make that work? Did you go along where the tiles meet and sort of uh, piece it together 
in that way so that you just can't notice it when you're looking at it, at least in pictures? Yeah, finding, like you say, the tiles of the print of the alligator are key to helping do that um, and pattern looks. I'm trying to find one on here. Um, I can't find this, my own splices. So there's That's sky, a good sign. Dude, whatever. <laughs> right in here, there's, there's a couple creases and in between them is a splice. Yeah, I can't even I notice. Know. <laughs> you know, there's not many, there's only a couple, but it's just really a matter of that, just gluing and skiving and, and getting it hit in the right spot. I, I really like those boots a lot. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely an award-winning boot for sure. You did, didn't you win a, uh, a trophy buckle for those? Yes. Okay. Congratulations. Very well-deserved. Too shiny over here. Sorry. <laughs> it's very well-deserved. Uh, so nice. Yeah. I want to remind everybody that uh, right now we're talking to Jim Brainerd of JB Custom Leather. And if you have any questions for him in particular, you can drop them in the live chat and I'll do my best to ask them. And I actually have a question here from David Trammell, who is wondering about the heel savers that uh, some folks put on their boots. Now, maybe you have a good perspective on this coming from shoe repair as well. What do you feel about those metal heel savers that are sometimes put on the bottom of the heel caps to help save that wear or make noise? Uh, do you have any perspective? I see you're hanging your head. You got an opinion. I want to hear it. No, it's just kind of funny when you said that to make noise. So um, yeah, they do that well. Um, <laughs> growing up in shoe repair, um, heel and toe taps or, or savers, whatever, we, we used to put a lot of them on. There was a vinyl one and a metal one. And, um, you know, it's all people which much more conservative and saving money and trying to make things last longer, which is a great thing, but it's uh, still to me, um, I don't like them. I don't want them. They're going to affect the way that I stand on balance and step. You're going to feel like you got, like you got a little rock stuck underneath you. Uh, if there, if your boots probably are, are more well balanced and a quality heel cap is put on them, uh, enjoy the, the wear that that will give you and, um, and let those things go. Cause they're just, you know, on a really sharp pointed, um, X toe boot or something. You might want to do one of those up on the toe if you're really a toe scuffer because uh, once you wear through that, that's usually one of the worst places that they'll wear the tip of that toe sole off and get to the welt. And once that welt's damaged, then it's more work for me to fix it for you, more money to you. That's kind of the only place I might consider it, but I really don't like them on the heels. I feel the same way. I did a video about that uh, during the winter, just putting them on an old pair of ropers that I had that needed the heel caps replaced anyways, just to see if it was worth it. I'd never done it before. I never wanted to just because it looked like it would make the foot land in a very strange way. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. I even got a blister on my heel because of the way that it was making me walk. And I had never felt that before even adding them. So it actually made my boot experience worse. And when you think about it, the the heel saver, maybe five bucks or uh, 10 bucks at the most, but then getting your heel caps replaced, maybe 25, 30 bucks. So you're really not saving that much money. And I feel like it's worth just getting the heel caps replaced when they need to be. Yep. I would agree oh, there. Thank you for asking that question, David, and also Jim for your answer. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your experience in the repair industry and then moving over to custom boot making? How do those industries differ if they differ at all? Well, they, they differ a lot, except for when it comes down maybe to if I make a pair of custom boots and I resole it, um, I don't treat it much different than I would a uh, street boot that someone brings into me. Other than if I'm resoling a pair of boots I made, it's going to go back on the last it was made on in order to do that repair. So that when I make 
put that new sole on, I can form it back the way it was originally formed to the last to that boot. When I'm doing repair work, um, we use what we call jack last and there's they're metal and they're they're just a, a basic curved form of a, a foot sort of and and that you go in there and they're good they're an anvil to hammer on you know and it's as a good repairman though you can still use that anvil to help um, reform the 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 arch the shank you know the boot as, as long as you're laying them on the soles on right and doing that it helps um, but one of the best things I think for me over my years of, of doing repair, it taught me a lot about different construction uh, factors, how boots are made um, differently or the same or whatever, and, and how to improve on that and how to work with that, you know, as, as far as to repair it. So there's a lot of variations to manufactured boots too, and even through custom made how about the industry working with people in boot repair from working with people in custom boots? Is it, is it more competitive in custom boot making than uh, shoe repair, vice versa? Like what's the vibes that you get from each industry, just from your uh, peers? Um, those vibes have changed over the years. They went from, um, total blackout to where I won't talk to you about what I do. I'm not telling you any trade secrets. Don't, don't ask. And I won't, I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to help you. And I know that from experience in the uh, early years, um, I kind of, you know, I'd learned a lot on the road by myself, sort of speak after, after my mentor sold me the business and I was kind of on my own and calling other shops and they, you know, they, I'd literally had hangups, you know, my, you'd ask a question and they, don't, they wouldn't talk to you. Today, um, there may still be some of that old school competitive and there are some trade secrets. A few of the guys, you know, it's like, I'm not going to tell you how I do that. I'll tell you a lot of things, but not how I do that. But they, everybody shares so well today. And that's what these trade shows show me. It's, uh, I'm not seeing a lot of repair industry people in anymore in what I do, even the repair industry itself has has diminished terribly. I mean, there's not a lot, and there's not a lot to share. And there are there are shops that are thriving in the repair industry, typically geographically and in uh, equestrian communities and things like that. I think there's there's more because there's more cowboys wearing boots and and getting them repaired than necessarily in the city where there's you know. City guys wearing dress shoes, which are pretty much very much disposable things that you can get so cheap today. Um, so there's not a competitive factor in repair. Um, we do like to compete in boot making, especially at the shows, but I still take that back to days of being a kid in a rodeo. It promotes you to work harder and do better, but we're, we're all comrades in doing it. It's, it's, a, it's a healthy competition. It is. I love to hear it. I feel like we could all benefit more from a healthy competition, uh, sort of jabbing with your competitors or with your peers, uh, just just to better yourself and uh, the the folks around you. That's 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 a fun thing to hear. One thing that we talked about previously when we spoke on the phone was the fact that you have purchased business businesses or pieces of them and even sold off some of your own, like you mentioned earlier in this interview. Um, that's something that I really don't talk to a lot of bootmakers about is uh, buying and selling portions of their businesses when you have done it a few times throughout your career. Um, can you tell me the benefits or maybe the disadvantages of purchasing portions of businesses and selling some of them off and how that uh, affects your business plan as a custom bootmaker? Well, let me, let me uh, kind of rearrange that story. And, you know, we talked about that a little bit, but what, what that comes about from is when I started with the, the initial shoe repair business that I bought um, I always call it a three-piece band, even though it's more than that. But there's the basics of equipment, curved needle stitcher, finisher, sewing machine, 
hand tools. So with that, with that little band set, you know, we can go out and do stuff, but there's, there's other things that sometimes we want, we need, we wear out, we break. So we, we add on. And when you're a young kid, when you're 18 years old and you just bought your first business and you have no money or no sense in your head, you, uh, you know, you work with what you got. And a lot of people still do. They start in and they, like, they say, you know, I just, I want a machine to sew leather. I'm like, well, what leather do you want to sew? Because there's a lot of machines for it. Um, you know, we just, we try to make do with what we got. Well, as I grew, I would try to add on machinery and sometimes I could afford to, and sometimes I couldn't, and I'd find shops and shops would be for sale. Nope. You can buy it all, but I'm not just selling one piece. And that started me into a, a process of going, um, eventually where I could, I, I would buy a whole shop so I could get the one piece I wanted and then I'd sell the rest of them off. And that was to, um, to grow my business, to get something I needed better. But it became more than that for me because the love of the industry, and since I've been in it since um, basically 1970, starting as a leather crafter to now, it's, um, I like keeping this stuff alive. And some of this machinery is not common. It's not easy to obtain. It's not brand new manufactured out the door. Sutton, Landis, those, those companies have primarily closed down. There's Landis International, there's, but you know, currently today there's Gateway, there's Shoe Systems Plus, and they manufacture some stuff or they remanufacture and rebuild and restore this stuff. But it, it just kept growing for me where I would start doing this, buying, improving what I had uh, to get something better and to, to sell off the rest. And it, it started working for me as a kind of a side business. I don't make it my business business, but I have to do it to make a little money. I, uh, I'll buy these shops up and I'll take this stuff to trade shows and get them in the hands of guys that want them. Um, I'll do it by advertising on the internet, whatever. I've, I've become a, um, one of the guys that sometimes people call me from the other side of the country and say, yeah, they said, call you, you might have this. And, you know, and I might. And I love it. I love to get these things staying alive. There's some of them that unfortunately even I have to say goodbye to and take to the scrapyard because they, they don't have any value and use in the industry anymore. And uh, some people are surprised at that, but it's like, it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, I, I like to do it. Um, Got to make a few dollars at doing it. It's a great thing for me to do at the trade shows. So I'm down there really to learn about boot making and to compete in the competition. But I need something else to do while I'm there. So I bring a trailer full of machines and, and sell them. So. Oh, wow. So you bring them along with you from yeah, Colorado boot, down to Wichita Falls. I, I, I rent booth spaces there and at Sheridan and uh, set up. You know, and bring I'll bring curve needle stitchers and finishers and patch machines and hand tools and last and you know everything in the in the trade that I can get my hands on from these other places I buy out. So it's uh, and it's fun. It, that's that's a great spot to be, especially because when somebody finds something um, like at the thrift store or whatever, and then puts it up on eBay, they might be just going crazy with the prices. Um, making it much more uh, expensive than what it needs to be. So it's it's nice to have uh, somebody like you. I'm sure people are super grateful that you're selling these uh, machines for what they're worth uh, or a little bit less than to help them get their business off the ground. Have you ever bought any businesses for any other reasons or has it just been primarily because of the equipment that they had? Yeah, I've never bought an, an active business to, uh, you know, keep running or, or to move or anything like that. Not at all. Um, it's, it's because they were closing the doors, retiring, passed away, you know, whatever the, the reasons are that, you know, other than that. So, no, um, I've had two retail storefronts at the same time, Cat one in Castle Rock and one in Parker at, at I'll say, the height of my uh um, retail front business days. You know, I'm a home-based business now. I have no more room in here. My wife makes fun of me because I have two or three of every machine. She goes, yeah, I have three of those. I'm like, 
you know, well, there's another one I want, you know, what, <laughs> it's like, there's a garage out there full of them. There's a big trailer up there full of them. And there's a 1200 square feet down here full of them. And, uh, but it's not that I'm hoarding them all in They're They're, they're to turn around and get to other people and, and things, but yeah, I'm a kid in a candy store. Oh, I like that one. I'm going to try this for a couple months and see how I like it, you know? Wow. Have you ever switched out a piece of equipment because you tried one that you purchased from a business and it made it into your full-time shop? Um, absolutely. And I've also switched out and thought I, this is the new, the new cat's meow on the bench and sold the old one. And a week later I was going, I missed the old one. I want the old one back, you know, cause it's, I used to say this about, and it still will, it's about like the curved needle stitchers, the outsole stitcher, if you will, that, that's another name that sews the sole on the bottom. I said, I swear that you could buy anyone that they built on, on the assembly line that one day, you know, we'll say they made six in that one day, they're all gonna be different. None of, they all have their own quirks and, and things about them that it's just interesting. Um, I've, I've seen guys with curved needle stitchers, we used to run them in, with wax, liquid wax to uh, protect the uh, cotton sinew that they used to sew with. A lot of people, some still use cotton sinew, um, like Texas traditions, you know, and, and, and good traditional stuff like that. And some of us use uh, poly or nylon threads these days. But the thing was, with all that wax, is these machines would get all crusted up and messy and all that. And the guy says, yeah, I just picked up this machine and I, and you know, it was sewing great. And then I, you know, I cleaned it all up and, and now it's not working. And I said, the problem is, is you cleaned it up because it's the way it wants to run. I mean, it's just, they're, they're very uh, temperamental machines. These 600 pound machines, they do what they want. You know, if you don't figure out what that is, you'll be in trouble, but. So you, yeah. you're finding the machines that are quirky to your liking uh, that you want around you? Well, you do, you know, it's, it's interesting. There's blogs out there for machinery. Um, you know, I also sell new machinery for leather machine company, the, the Cobra brand. And, um, and I'm plugging for them because they're the best service people in the industry. They stand behind stuff, you know, and it, but the, they, they have a um, online, site blog that people come in all the time asking, you know, I can't get it to do this. It's doing that. I'm having a problem with this and that. Really, when it comes down to it, yes, getting to know your machine, again, is, is one thing. Getting to know machinery, period, is another thing. And um, I just tell guys, 90% of our problem sewing leather is the operator error. It really is, even for me. I mean, I've been sewing as 50, 51 years. And this, most of the stuff that I mess up or that I have problems with is because I wasn't paying attention to something. I didn't have something just right. You know, it just, it's bizarre, but machines are generally pretty darn good. It's just, we have to figure them out and to figure ourselves out. <laughs> it's a good exercise in, uh, in patience, I bet. Uh, yeah. Patience, uh, patience is important here. We can have frustrating days where you just take that boot and throw it in the corner and come back another day because it's just not working. <laughs> I hear that so much talking with uh, custom bootmakers like yourself is that it's all about patience. And that is pretty much the most valuable thing that they've learned from the craft, doing it for years. Would you agree that that is uh, the biggest virtue that you've learned? Or is there something else that stands out to you that comes above patience? Well, being from the repair industry, it was a hustle. You got to go, you got to get it done. You got to be ready. The guy needs it tomorrow. I can't wait. And so the, there's, there's not a lot of time for patience there. It's, it's precision and, and speed and time to get it done. To sit down and to learn how to sew multi-row layer, uh, rows of stitching, one row at a time. People don't always see that or know that and understand that. I mean, this is whatever, six rows of stitches. So it's not that many, but to, the patience it takes to follow that and get used to doing that, um, you want to add speed to it. And if you're impatient yeah, and you try to add speed before you're used to doing it, no, patience is great. It's almost, 
It's almost as difficult as learning to raise children. <laughs> a lot of patience. Wow. I love that, uh, that similarity there, that analogy. That's such a good one. <laughs> Um, I'm going to pivot here and ask you a couple of random questions that have come through on the live chat. We got uh, three here that, that, and I feel like this is a good moment to, to sort of bring them in here. Uh, they're just sort of all over the place. Uh, so uh, bear with us for a second. Uh, York asks uh, about tooled leather and the differences between tooled leather from a factory boot to maybe uh, tooled leather from your shop or another custom boot maker. Is the tooled leather coming from factories, uh, those tooled leather boots, are they mostly embossed or do they actually tool them like you would? All right, so um, my answer would be first to say more often embossed, but we're gonna talk about price and that's gonna make some of the difference. But some of the um, shops that do, um, that aren't one man shops, you know, little bigger production shops have craftsmen who hand tool their tops. Um, but let's, and to throw me in the mix of this, I've done hand tooling. I started hand tooling as a kid. I have not hand tooled boot tops. And that is a different, um, kind of, I'll call it a niche in, in what a boot maker might do or might not do. I don't know a lot of boot makers that tool tops. There are plenty that do, but I don't, you know, I just don't know a lot of us that, that do it that way. Um, but price will tell me, sometimes a look. And fortunately, there's a lot of tooling that comes out of um, prisons, Mexico, other places where it's, it's a, it's paid for inexpensively and able to, to get put on a, on a pair of boots. Um, so for me to sit down and, you know, if I was going to do go about that and try to tool a pair of tops or for a pair of boots, um, it's going to be very expensive, you know, and, and I will do it. Absolutely. But it's a, it's a long expensive process and, and timely for me. So do you have people in your network where uh, you will commission toolings? I've heard of other bootmakers commissioning people who Absolutely. just tool leather. Absolutely. So, you know, that that's always options. They even There's even uh, makers who commission others to do top stitching and patterns and inlays and overlays. You know, they, they build a great boot, but it's like the artwork part of it may not be their cup of tea to it, you know, or something outside of where they want to go. And I, I, uh, you know, I respect and uphold that with all the makers, because we all either we have areas that we're familiar with, and we're good at, and we have areas that we're not, and we don't want to go or will go. Uh, a lot of boot makers I know grew up like me in the, in the repair business, too. And they say, I stopped doing repair. I won't do repairs. And I mean, stuff like fixing the broken zipper on this or, you know, sewing up the saddlebags and that kind of stuff too. Not, not that they won't repair soles and heels, but even some of them don't want to do that outside of their own boots. So um, for the same matter, whether they're going to tool their own tops or have somebody else do it. Yes. We have people we can network with and do that. I, I love hearing that. It reminds me of what happens in music too. And you're not going to play every single instrument, right? So you're going to need a drummer uh, to put down a track or somebody to uh, be featured as an extra singer, right? Because I'm not going to sing the female parts, right? So I, I feel like there's a similarity there that, that kind of crosses over. Um, people have their expertises and there's no reason not to pay them and use their talents uh, and work together in a collaborative way like that. So I love hearing that. Yeah, and it's true. Almost everything you just said, except for Stevie Wonder. So if we're going to put <laughs> somebody that could put it all together. But, right. Okay. Yeah. Respect. <laughs> <laughs> I got another question here from Nee Montiel, who asks an interesting question. Uh, what sort of socks 
are the most comfortable to wear with boots. I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective as a custom boot maker. Is there a, a way that you look at stocks and what your customers should wear, or is it all about preference? So the way I was kind of taught and the way I do and use is, is I like to tell people that I want them to come in when I'm going to fit them with a boot sock. And it's like, well, what's a boot sock? You know, kind of a, a, a mid weight athletic type sock, you know, cotton socks are good. Um, but I, I don't want a real thin dress sock for them to try uh, to get measured in. And I don't want a real heavy wool winter sock on there. That, that mid range thing is good. Our feet you know, um, swell, they shrink, they, you know, they're, they're different every day and all the time. And the, and the leather, even depending on the leathers you're getting in, your feet into boot wise, um, react to temperatures and, and climates and all that as well. So starting with that boot sock, as we call it, or as I call it, um, is a great place to be for comfort. Um, you're going to get measured in it, that you're going to wear that kind of sock when you wear your boots and be it'll be the most versatile for where your feet and the leather at and, and those kind of things that day. So do you have a specific brand that no. uh, you recommend? No, no, nope. I curious. get, I get frustrated with brands of socks. Cause it's like, you know, I just want to go out and buy fruit of loom. And it's like, I can't even think that sometimes some of the manufactured stuff I'm used to is, is all that good anymore, you know, and, and some of the better socks I I've tried uh, getting from, uh, some of them out there, they're, they're just like, they're either too heavy for me or too thick. They're or they don't socks. stay up all day. Or they don't stay up, whatever, you know. <laughs> it's tough finding a good You gotta find socks. something that you like and what you want. But I just recommend trying to, to work something in that mid-weight when you go to get boots and, and do it that way. Great, thank you for that answer. That's gonna be very valuable to a lot of people. Here's one that's a, a little bit more of a broad question that I'm interested to hear your perspective on. And I pretty much know what you're gonna say, of course. Um, but uh, here's the question from Aiden Mackle. Uh, can you wear cowboy boots if you're not a working cowboy? You betcha. Why? Because they're, they're just the best footwear there is. I mean, I don't know why to, why do you tell you they're comfortable. Um, they're classic that, you know, when it comes to Western wear, Western wear has never gone away. You can tell all the fashions you want and see where they've come and gone, but this one never goes away. So why not be classical and, and be with the rest of the class, you know, wear them cowboy boots. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Thank you for the question, Aiden. Great answer, Jim. Thank you. Also, here's the last random question I have from Alan during this little random question section here. Uh, what's the softest leather that you've ever worked with? Um, well, not in boot making. The softest leather would probably be lambskin, but it's not going in any boots. Um, so <laughs> we can uh, get into... You know, goat skins pretty nice and soft. Some of the some of the calf skins, kangaroo, they're soft, but they're also some very durable leathers. So, those kind of are in the, the soft range as far as an exterior vamp or or top leather that I'd be looking at. Would you use them for Never inlay? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Would you use them for inlay or anything like that on a pair oh, yeah. of boots, or you just wouldn't use lamb at all? Oh. Ah, uh, yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it. Most of the lambskin stuff comes into really nice garment type things, but the, the layers, so the epidurus or whatever of our skin layers, you know, just like people, there's layers. And no matter the tanning process on that, it's very easy to pull the layers apart on lambskin. They just don't have the, the fiber density that they need to really wear. You could certainly put it in some inlays and stuff where there's not movement and things in the top, but why? You know, if we want colors and, and for inlays and all, um, you know, the calf skins, the goat skins, those, those things, there's, there's plenty of that. And it's nice thin stuff that we can skive out the edges and blend in really well. So, Love it. Those are classics for sure. Um, are there any sayings, like any common sayings in your industry that just – rub you the wrong way at any pet peeve sayings. 
Um, no, I mean, there's, there's sometimes attitudes of there's the right way or the only way, but I don't see a real saying in that. But I, okay, I how love about this one. saying. How about this saying? How, how about this saying, if it's like a glove? Uh, well, you took that from me. <laughs> I want it. I want it. You know, people say, I want, I want custom boots because it's going to fit like a glove. And I said, I have never bought a pair of gloves that fit. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's just the way, you know, it's just the way I feel about gloves. So um, <laughs> I hear I you. Want a pair, I want a pair of boots that fits my feet and feels good on my foot and not like a glove. I hear you. I've had the same problem every time. Every time somebody says that, and I've sort of worked it in a little bit here and there, but I've never really understood it because I got like really big hands with long fingers. Even the extra large gloves, they never fit right. It just doesn't work for me. <laughs> so I did, I did always have one, and I say this with great admiration and love to my, my first mentor in boot making, Hutch. He would get to a point in, in his uh, older years, and he would say, well... There's nothing I can do about it. And that one frustrates me to no end. It's like, there's nothing that I do that ends up with, that's where I'm going to, I'm going to walk away from it. If it doesn't go right, if it doesn't fit right, if it didn't come out right, there's something I'm going to do about it. I cannot stand the thought of going, there's nothing I can do about it. You know? And so that's, that would be my worst saying coming from my closest companion in the business. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I like that. It's, uh, there's always something for sure that you can do, unless like it's super out of your control. If you want to talk about, you know, well, there's world a reality, affairs. Yeah. yeah. But uh, if, if, if it's in your industry and, and you want to try, uh, or maybe you, you built it, then uh, yeah, I don't see why not why you can't give a, give it a shot. Um, do you make anything else besides cowboy boots that you've tried and how has that experience been? Well, say I started in, in this industry, basically from hand tooling belts, wallets, shaps. I've made vests, pants, um, hats, mittens, never made gloves cause they never fit. Um, <laughs> I have, I have made uh, slings, scabbards, moccasins, you know, I think you can name it and I, and I probably made it, you know, sheaves, holsters, et cetera, like that. I had done maybe three pairs of shoes over in my life. So I learned to do a shoe by uh, essentially, I had a client who sent me alligator and he wanted flip-flop sandals and, and clutch purses for the wives and all these guys live in uh, Georgia and Florida and whatever, these guys that hunt them, but they weren't cowboy boot wearers. So they'd send out and he said, can you make golf shoes? And I said, well, I don't know. I said, send me a pair of golf shoes that you like that are worn out or whatever, so I can make a pattern. And I did, and he loves them. So I made in that. This pair of shoes comes from a pair of dress shoes my son wore that were black tore them apart, made a pattern. So I call these copycats when I do that. I have no idea what the heck I'm doing when I do that. Um, but I, I used to do it for like ladies' handbags. They would come in, my old bag, it wore out. That's not the husband talking. That's, you know, the wife, she says, so um, I would like it. I really like this purse and I can't find it. And I said, I'll make you a new one. But I said, I'm going to take your old one apart so I can make it, you know, and, and pattern it. So that's the kind of thing like that. Um, I love, you know, going down some of those avenues. I get people today, some people though, they go, like, can you make this? And I say, yes, but I won't. You know, I'm, I'm getting to getting old and cranky and it's like, I don't want to make everything anymore. <laughs> I've had fun doing a lot of it, but I won't do everything. What are some of the things that you won't make? Um, you know, I tried, to, I tried to get a rim shot joke off on that one, but I missed it, so. Um, <laughs> Um, I had somebody ask me about some kind of special cover 
for a seat on a saddle this week. Um, I said, you know, they use, there's the manufacturers out there that made these covers like sheepskin and it form fitted on the cannel and all, everything right for the saddle. I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not willing to or able at this time to take the time to figure out the pattern and all that because pattern making takes a lot of time. And when somebody wants something special made that there's nothing to go off of, um, engineering that, you know, today's um, manufactured items come off of computers that are generated and sent to, uh, you know, laser cutters and all these things that can do it perfectly. And they may be assembled by hand eventually, but they're, uh, it's, it's so much involved. So there's so many things that I won't make. I don't, I don't have any one set thing like, don't ask me that. If I, if I don't like it or it's, it's not going to fit into a time or a cost, I'll say no. Makes sense. Makes sense. I got a couple more questions here through in the live chat. Got one from Edgardo, and he's asking about the differences between a full welt boot and one with the lemon wood pegs in there. And if it's possible to ever convert the two and take a full welt and have um, pegs instead. And if you would want, like, why would you want to? What's the value there? First, I'd probably want to see what kind of heel height and shape this boot is and, and what it is. Um, it kind of comes down to the same premise. Sometimes I'll get someone come in and go, these were my daddy's boots and they're too big and I, I, I want to keep them and, and can you re-last them and make them fit me? And yes, and you can do the same thing, you know, in the right, with the right amount of material, the right size thing, you can relast some of these things onto from what was maybe a low flat heel shoe or boot, uh, like a roper and, and put it up onto a, you know, an inch and a half tall heel. Um, but you're going to change the insole to do that so that you can relast it to that and, um, you know, and then do a, a half or three quarter well, like we're talking about, and and wood peg the the shank in and all that. So it's it's certainly possible, and it it would be it doesn't make it a better piece of footwear because it's wood pegged or not, but it depends on how it's built. Because if if we're only dealing with a half well, you know, around the, around the ball of the foot, um, side to side, it's you you've got to hold the rest of it together. And the way we do it in, in handmade boots is wood pegs uh, in a traditional method rather than nails, which rust out. And, and um, it's, just, it's just not the way we do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the can next, be done. It can be done, but there's, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a process because you even have to change the insole, you're saying. Yeah, it's, and it's a pricey process. I can imagine you got to take the whole boot apart, right? Generally, sometimes you can, it just depends again. It's, it's case by case by case basis on, on whether it will be applicable to that piece of footwear. Gotcha. That's a good question, Edgardo. Thank you for asking. Next question comes from Andrew, um, who asks, uh, what are your favorite details to put in the boot? I see over here that you have one of a, of the Broncos there. Are, is that like your sort of favorite going the sports team route? You like some different inlay, stitch patterns? What's, what's your favorite thing to do? Or is it just sort of whatever the customer wants? It is what the customer wants. The, you know, the very few boots that you see up behind me are about all that I've made outside of a customer because I don't have, you don't have time to, to make a lot of those things. Sometimes I put these together for a show. Um, details, um, everything's a detail in making it. I miss a stitch in a row where I don't want it. It's a, it's a huge detail to me. So it's not, I, it's not what he's asking and what's my favorite. But my favorite thing is to do is not mess up the details that I want to come out. But that's not all possible because I'm a human and I'm imperfect. Um, so this kind of stuff though, this was another, what I call a concept boot. Um, I'm pretty, I'm really happy with this inlay cause it's very flat flush. There's no, you can't tell that it's more than one layer basically by the thickness. It's important to me, the skiving that those inlays, um, 
skive down very flat. We, we don't want to see the ridges of, underneath the, the base color of the white coming under there. But you can see that in some leathers, even, even in the best skive. So that detail is important. Um, some of it too is that um, a lot of times when we do inlays, we do, we sew around them, but we also do another thing we call in the ditch. And that's, that's on the inside edge of, of the inlay. Uh, this particular boot, I didn't do that with that, but many inlays we do, it makes a whole big difference in the detail look of not just sewing around the outer edge and as close to the edge as you can get, because you see uh, shelf bot boots with a lot of fancy inlays and all, and there's a 16th of an inch between the edge of the leather and the stitch. And I don't think that's a good detail. I think it, it shows as more of a manufactured boot, a very quickly made, easier way to do that. It takes a lot more detail focus to sew that thing really close to the edge. And a lot of inlays, it makes them pop out and look better to sew the inside in the ditch. And uh, a lot of my cronies, if they're listening or not, they know exactly what I mean by that. And then you can do weird things like this. So, <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, football would be great. Um, just to FYI, this is truly Horween football leather. By oh, wow. Manufacturer. Um, which in the pull tab, you can see the, you can see the grain, but what I learned lasting a wet lasting of Corween leather football leather takes that pebble out of it so that wasn't the best of ideas there but that's so an interesting on there nice love it <laughs> got the super bowl trophy manning and his mate his mate where did he go he's up there you know who that is elway there you go. Nice. What a and great neither, pair of boots. Neither one of them called me, so I guess I'm just stuck with it. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jim, thank you so much for taking this time today on Ask the Bootmaker. I really appreciate you sharing your expertise and your time. And for everybody watching and answer, asking the questions, uh, is there anything that uh, you'd like to leave us with, uh, whether that be your website and Instagram handles or just a parting piece of wisdom to share? Um, I think it's, first of all, wonderful that, that you take your time to, uh, to showcase ours. And I just hope people look at you in the same way. Look at us, we're artists. We all have our things, whether it's music or, or handmade crafts or uh, what it be. So, um, you know, respect to each one of you who are artists and, and those who are looking for artists, um, find us. I'm here, yeah, I'm on, I'm on Instagram, Facebook, got a website that's uh, rarely kept. I spend most of my time, I'll throw up stuff on Instagram, but uh, appreciate you as an artist and then being with us. Uh, last boot maker that, that I uh, taught with, um, he's a musician as well. And he compares music to boot making. I don't know how, but he says there's a thing about the time he's a drummer and in counting and all this. It's a very, he says, a kind of a parallel thing to the art. So us artists, we're strange, but uh, we love it. You got to be. It's so true. <laughs> love it for sure. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, It was a pleasure having you. I love doing these and and uh, spreading the joy of Cowboy Boots and uh, your your craft needs uh, to stay alive. So I'm going to do whatever I can to, uh, to help increase the interest in it. Again, thank you so much for your time, Jim. And uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you later. Thanks, Jeremiah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.